You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. All right, everybody. This is a little bit of a bonus episode here that I wanted to give everyone. The Bassmasters are back. FLW is doing whatever the hell they want to do now since they changed the rules up. But that's a whole different topic for a different day. And so I wanted to talk about not only like what's going on in Florida, but also about grass fishing 101, because we live on the Potomac River. We also have the James River and we have tons of grass fisheries. And who else than a guy that came up here his first time, I think, out of the state of Florida. And he kicked everyone's ass on the Potomac River uh harry linsenberger dude thank you so much for coming back on the show like for the people that don't know who you are they soon will uh t- tell people who you are at home um it depends on who you talk to some people call me harry the hammer that's probably my favorite uh nickname oh, i love that uh, that's gonna be a thumbnail yeah so um <laughs> I install water softeners that's uh, i do not fish full-time yet i'm trying to make it happen but not yet um you know it takes a little bit of time to to that to do that i just stepped up to the front of the boat last year um so second tournament i did win the potomac um struggled a little bit when we went to smallmouth country and then um i'm fishing the southern toyotas this year so um staying around home and uh hopefully gonna end up on table rock this year but well and to hype you up a little bit more uh you also fish a tournament this year the toyota series correct yeah yep so i uh, got 13th in that out of 260 so we um out of some hammers yeah. i mean some freaking ass hammers <laughs> i remember guys a little like i was talking to you like during that thing it's like i was i was gonna send you some fireball if you finished in like the top 10 and holy shit dude, you were so close i uh, know i was like uh i was I thought I was going to be top 10 for a little bit, but, um, and I thought that you were going to be sending me, I, I almost sent you the day before that you're, that you're, that you're going to need to be sending me firewall, but I didn't. And then, you know, I kind of, I should have, I, I maybe I should have, maybe that was, that's why I didn't catch that one more fish that pushed me over is cause I, I, I think it, it, I, I think it was because like I was watch, I was scrolling through it and I was like, ah, oh, man, you finished in the top 20 is still pretty good or top 22. And you're like, dude, it didn't update. And yeah. that thing did not update for the longest time. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. Like, I thought maybe you finished a little bit higher. The, the 13th, dude, is fin- It's like a great finish, a great way to start the year. And it shows you, like, I mean, guys, we were talking for about three hours before we started streaming here about making decisions and choices. And I really like the idea of, like, it's not about how high you finish. It's about how low. And if, it, if 13th is the lowest you finish all year, you're going to be you're going to be doing really, really well. Yeah, well, hopefully that's how it is. Uh, we'll see, but it's definitely going to be, especially Okeechobee, because it's like because of how it's fishing right now. It's it's going to be, um, it's going to be an interesting season. Hopefully, um, I get on those brush pile fish um, on Eufaula, but we'll see on that. But um, if I finish thirteenth and that's my lowest finish, I will probably be angler of the year. So hopefully, hopefully, and soon you'll be doing this full time. Yeah. Um, but guys, like, hey, the floor is yours. Uh, where did you want to get started with this grass kind of seminar? How did you want to like? How did you want? Yeah, do definitely. So, um, basically, we're gonna break it down into a couple different categories of grass because how you fish them is changes based off of what you're fishing. Um, some of the concepts apply um, across the board, but we'll just go ahead and break them down and talk them in each category. Um, and then, uh, I guess we're going to pop a couple pictures up on screen. So that way you guys kind of understand what we're talking about, like what the grass looks like. So, um, first we're going to talk about submerged grass. Um, this is going to be your hydrilla, uh, your pepper grass, milfoil, coontail, eel grass. Um, this is going to apply a lot to you guys that are fishing the Potomac. Um, this is how I won on the Potomac was fishing a lot of the submerged grass, um, So basically what you're looking for out there um, is you're looking for like whenever you're fishing through it, you're just looking for populations of fish where they're setting up. Um, What they're setting up on doesn't really technically matter because you can't normally tell um, maybe if it's like real clear, you can look down there whenever you start catching fish, notice the differences. Um, A lot of the times there's holes in the grass um but again a lot of times you can't really see that you might be able to see it on your electronics um 
we're showing uh i think that's hydrilla right now um i don't think that's coontail yeah that's hydrilla so um but basically you're looking for those differences that the fish are relating to um most of the time it's not evident a lot of the times it's like hard bottom or rocks or something that's mixed in there um that the bait might be relating to or crawfish or whatever they're eating um so the best way that I've found to personally like fish through those areas is to find a bait that, that, uh, you can cover a lot of water with. Um, it doesn't really matter if you catch all those fish that day. Um, cause you can slow down later. Once you locate a population of fish, you really just need like one or two fish out of that group to bite. So, um, a lot of baits that are good for that, um, are going to be like your lipless crankbaits and your, uh, vibrating jigs and then your regular swim jigs depending on the clarity of the water are, are lipless crankbaits still a thing uh a thousand percent so it's just so funny because like how many people like i talk to about like all i throw is a chatterbait and you probably saw when you went to the potomac like everyone throws a chatterbait it's like i like a lipless still but it's so crazy it's like i feel like the chatterbait is like made the lipless more lethal honestly because no one likes to throw them anymore i think that the lipless is a little bit more specialized it's not as universal like a chatterbait you have a three eighths ounce a half ounce three quarter ounce jackhammer and you're just you're good like like you can fish basically any grass that grows in most fisheries um you know so you really only need three sizes you can stick with the same color liplesses you have to change line size to get the or you have to change bait styles um, or you have to change weights, like those three things It makes things complicated for people. So, you know, you throw like an original Bill Lewis will run a little bit shallower than like a XRK 50, um, will, uh, which runs a little bit, um, shallower than like, let's say like, a, a LV 500, right. LV 500 would be the deepest, um, Bill Lewis being the shallowest. So you kind of have to change your baits a lot more than you do with a, like, you can just force a chatterbait through that. So definitely chatterbait would be a little bit easier than a lipless, but uh, definitely hit those lipless once you locate those fish. Or if you just know that they're in a depth range, that it's good for the lipless. Could you also think it's like, do you rather have a treble hook or just a single hook? I'd rather have 20 pound test <laughs> in a single hook. So, I mean, but, but you can't. So if you have a group of fish, like let's say that you locate a group of good group of fish and you really need another fish, but they you've already caught most of the fish that are wanting to eat the chatterbait, you pick up a lipless, you could probably stick two or three more. Um, you know, just because not all those fish are going to want to eat that 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 uh vibrating jig. Um they fish number one have had different experiences some of them have probably been stuck and released on that vibrating jig and they don't want to eat it again right um so you just kind of got to keep that in mind it's good to play around with that um more advanced options would be like a square bill square bills are kind of hard to get through the grass but sometimes you can get that perfect situation um jerk baits kind of the same thing um you know but you're playing a lot with water clarity there they're not they're not as big of a plug and play on the jerk baits too um and they're kind of hard especially when the grass is floating on the top to get through clean so good deal good deal so i will bring the image right back up there did you want me to switch to uh pepper grass uh yeah we could go through everything so that way people can see that um so pepper grass i don't know how much you guys have that up around you but around in florida that's a big thing in certain lakes around us where the pepper grass will be there. You get that offshore, especially in our clearer lakes. Um, you see it on Okeechobee. Um, I've seen it out to like 15 foot in, uh, people mostly know West Lake Toho cause that's on the Kissimmee chain. Um, there's East Lake Toho, which is a lot smaller, a lot clearer, a lot deeper. Pepper grass is the main vegetation out there. At least last time I was out there, it grows out to like 15 foot of water out there. It's stupid, but, um, that's a really good offshore, uh, submergent grass, um milfoil coontail up there is going to be big too um and then eel grass which uh if you guys don't know um i think we got a picture of eel grass yeah so that's what eel grass is it's basically like a long thin um really good for chatterbait getting chatterbaits and other baits through um especially if you've got current or something moving through um 
you'll see like you'll notice like that especially like lays all lays over one way so it's really easy to get it through that grass um crankbaits stuff like that especially um you can do that same thing with milfoil and hydro and stuff too it does make it easier if you're if you've got current moving through if you're going if you're bringing your bait with the current um just because the grass lays over that way so are, are you looking for mixes generally speaking is that like um, i don't think it, i don't i fish everything my rule is is i don't know what those fish are doing i don't know what's under the ground so i fish everything and let the fish tell me where they are um and then normally you tend to be able to eliminate depth ranges um like that they're not shallower than four foot of water right um or maybe it's the top of the grass that they're relating to is in a certain depth range but um typically you can eliminate some water focus on a certain depth range where you're, you've been getting bit and then just fish all of it through there because like a lot of times you don't know that there's a shell bar in that or that there's shell in that grass so you just kind of got to fish everything and not um not be too selective as to what you're fishing and what you're running and then just locate those populations of fish it does take a little bit of time um we were talking off camera about like running patterns um like on table rock and stuff where you can just tell like certain um certain rocks or shell or whatever like you can just run certain ones and you can tell what it is like you can't really cheat like that with grass because you don't know you can't see what's on water um it's just because it's and you can't graph for it either like you can't see it on your graph because it's covered up by grass so you just got to fish it um takes a little bit more time but do it it's worth it good deal good deal like and that's like a uh, one thing we did talk about um or we briefly mentioned off camera was just about like a uh, community holes yeah like in a community hole when you're dealing with a maybe a table rock where it's like a row of docks because everyone like drops fish there after a tournament versus a community grass mat because basically the potomac is one whole community hole basically yeah. um how do you approach that where it's like you know mad woman people dump fish there every day from april until october so there are fish and if there's grass there but there's a shit ton of boats which is like a lot of places uh in florida how do you do you approach that differently than when you're trying to get away to people like how you approach practicing in an area like that um a little bit um you have to keep in mind whenever you're practicing that especially for multi-day events um that those fish are going to be pressured especially days two and three um people might lay off of them day one um but we'll talk about matter woman specifically like that place is just stupid i just like like that is an exception um it seems like just there's so many fish there um it, so whenever we were there um there were a lot of boats that that you could just you could cycle through areas there were boats that would cycle through those areas and they would just reload and reload and reload like there's just so many fish there it's it's and it would get and it did get harder throughout the tournament like my buddy was up in there um in a different section than i was in there were guys there were two guys that blew engines that like literally stayed on their trolling motors right out like right outside the off limits that i'm pretty sure they both made the money cut um i know that their co-anglers did good out of there like it's like that is like fantasy land to me um that 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 happens sometimes in florida um and like from my experience um but a lot of the times those fish, and if you go look in the tag studies too, um, they're, uh, most of those fish, like they'll start to disperse, but if there's not enough bait there, they're going to like keep going until they find where there's bait. So Matta Woman, I think, has enough bait, enough forage to hold those fish for long periods of time um, in order to keep those big populations right there, that those populations don't leave that creek um generally when you're dealing with a big grass mat that's in a community hole where you're going to get a, sh a a ton of boats on it yeah do those do, do those fish compress down into the grass into the holes or do they just try to move to the area of the mat that there's not as much boat traffic because i've heard two hypotheses on that like one is they'll just shut off and stay in one spot until they turn on again and the others is like 
go to the part of the mat that there's like no boats because that's where the fish are going to move away from the boat pressure. Um, I mean, it depends. Like if you're talking about, you're talking about like, like actual matted grass or you're talking about submergent submerged grass. Okay. So from my experience, um, there is like whenever you're on those community grass beds, there's so many fish there that there's fish that are also set up on the outside. And once those fish in the middle get pounded um, with all those trolling motors over their heads, for whatever reason, it seems like either either the, the only place you can really get bit is on the outside. So I don't, like, it almost does seem like they come out, like they, they leave that area. But if you watch, like, what when that happens, like there's still guys catching fish on the inside. Um, so, but is it the pressure that they just move away and they turn back on? I think so. Um, that, that it's all those trolling motors right over the top of their heads. Cause you got to think like most of this grass that you're seeing on these community grass, like, like there's five, six foot of water. Trolling motors are two foot in the water. Um, so that's so these trolling motors are whizzing around on top of their heads, like three foot down one person sticks a fish out of a community grass bed, what happens? Everybody goes from like this, yeah, like right up, right up. Like, like it's like a magnet. Like you catch a fish, it doesn't matter if that fish is eight inches. Everybody's yep. right here. Right there. So I, I think that that shuts down fish specifically. But you'll still see people catching fish and then everybody moves away, somebody off by themselves, like in the middle, like like can still will still stick a fish. But they, they they hurt each other. So those guys that are on the outside, um, I, it might push some of the smarter fish, the bigger fish, to that outside. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but there still seems to be fish everywhere. Um, there there might be less in the middle, but I I definitely think that it does um, it does make the the outside at least seem better, appear better, um, like, like fish better than what's on the inside even though you might have been getting more bites in practice on the inside because people weren't all freaking destroying each other like oh he caught a fish let me go there because i want to catch that same fish that he already put in the boat it it is interesting because as we're talking it's like you know you are blessed where you have so much grass even with all the the florida spraying and stuff you have so much grass but then if you look at belmont bay matter woman you have all these places we get really on top of each other here. And so people deal with these insanely traffic jammed areas, unless you have an outlier of one dude that finds the juice by himself, like, you know, on top of each other. So we could talk about Belmont Bay whenever I was there, uh, which is typically like, kind of like how um, I've noticed a lot of grass flats are. Um, There are areas with better populations of fish. But I literally went in a, like a two square mile, like or like a one square mile circle, like or like one, squ- yeah, um, like area. It was kind of like a semicircle or whatever. But um, and I caught fish in like an entire, like like I kid you not, it was at least like a one square mile. One day I practiced, I spent my whole entire practice in Belmont. I caught fish everywhere in all that grass. There were areas that had better groups of fish, like where you'd stick like a couple, like in like shorter, like you'd go like longer periods without a bite, but they were literally everywhere within, um, I, I stuck so many fish that day. Like, cause like I was buzzing around, like obviously like to cover that much water. Like I spent a lot of time on the troll motor, just drawing lines like through that graph. But I, I mean, you know, but come tournament day, like there's going to be people that are going to want to all be in like, like one person, catches one and like those guys that had caught them like all in like this like large area one guy catches them and they all start (laughs) moving around there even though there's fish Uh, across that whole entire bay like yeah i i mean you know and there's places that were definitely seen better than others in belmont and i i think i fished there for a total of 30 minutes because i went in there and i was like this is stupid i need to find bigger fish and left but because like at that point it seems like i think i heard later in the season belmont gets worse because so many fish get taken out of it um like the the larger population like the bigger fish that have already been caught out of there so they've been transported so it's harder to catch those bigger quality of fish 
And then the next year they reload because that next age class moves up, um, I guess, is what happens in Belmont. Pretty much. Belmont, Belmont's weird because, like, I mean, if you were going to guide Belmont, you're going to always catch fish out of. But, like, there's a there's a period, there's a window in there, depending on the, when your tournament is, where you can get in there and you can win. And it's usually earlier on if you can be the first tournament, yeah, the big tournament. And then the beach down in Aquia Creek, they usually produce good bags down there at Aquia. The problem is that's a hell of a run. And it, unless you're going to milk run the tide, you're kind of committed to going down to Aquia. And that kind of leaves, you know, the areas that you want in, Mata Woman, uh, Chick, places like that in that middle area to, to pick from. Aquia is um, downriver of uh, yes. Potomac, the Potomac Creek. Up, one up of Potomac Creek. Okay. Okay. So it's between Quantico and Potomac. Yeah. Potomac is... Potomac is where the Italian guy won like two years yeah, ago. Yeah, the Taco that, Warehouse. Because I went down, that's about the further south that I went. Um, I think Aquia was the one that sucked whenever I was there. Like, and it, w- it was packed too, right? Uh, there was a lot of boats in there. There wasn't a lot of catching going on. Yeah, that's that's the beach. And Potomac can be good too. The problem with Potomac is it's so it if that thing will get hit hard and then it's dead for a couple of years and then the Potomac will come back. Um. I won a tournament down there in high school fishing the Potomac. And then what happened is it got good for a couple of years and people pounded it and moved fish out of it because it's tidal. And that's what I think is like, it takes time for those like really backwater creeks to reload. Yeah. My opinion. There's two guys in the, uh, the, there's the two guys that were leading were both down there. And that like the day before I won, like both those guys, they were, they were down there in Potomac. I don't know. I don't know what fish they were on. And then um, there was another guy down there too that I know that that, or at least um, from what I understood, that's where he was at, um, fishing some other stuff that was different because he saw them too. I was talking to him, um, that because uh, he had he has the invitational uh, here. Uh, I was talking to him last year about it. He knew he already knew the schedule. And uh, he wanted to pick my brain because that invitational is the same time as whenever I won. So, but that's interesting because it's like it really comes down to whether it's creeks on the Potomac or grass on Okeechobee. It's about finding the area that has the better quality of fish. Yeah. Like, you know, when I've won on the Potomac, it's like the area I picked I knew would have the caliber of fish to win. And then you can make the decision of whether it's worth waiting for them to turn on or not. And, right when you made your decisions there um, to win, it's the same thing. I think that's what's interesting is like how many fish do you need to catch out of a grass bed to be like, eh, this one's probably should be number one priority. Um, I mean, I, whenever I practice, I just have a, like on the Potomac, for example, like I had more spots than I was able to hit in the tournament. And that one spot that I ended up um, catching that 19 out of my 20 pounds off of, um, the uh, i called once after i'd caught that 19 pounds but that was it um off of a different spot but um that that specifically um i didn't know that it was like that at all i just caught a couple fish off of there the the first day i like went to stop there i didn't feel right i i the it was slack tied so i was like well i need to go hit my frog fish went to my frog fish started catching fish but um and never went back there because I caught like 14 pounds the first day and I thought that I was good. I thought that I would be in contention that that was about the max. I need to go look for fish. So, um, but, but basically what I'm saying is, is like you, if you fish that hard and you know that you can catch 20 pounds off of there, you just mess that spot up because you just caught 20 pounds off of it. And there's not that many fish that are going to be relating there. So especially like maybe you could do that in a single day event, but I caught like maybe like 14 pounds off of it day two. And then um, like I would have had about 14 pounds off of it day two. And then I caught 20 day three. I cycled through that area several times and I didn't get bit. And again, out of, after I caught that 20 pounds, very good. Um, I don't, I might've caught like a couple smaller fish, but a lot of the times whenever you're finding the better schools of fish, the like that they're not very big. So you're just looking for fish and then you sort that out in the tournament, in my opinion. Like it's just, you just run stuff. 
if you're fishing single day events, you can um, practice a little bit harder, but don't keep go checking those fish. Check those fish in the tournament. Once you know that there's better quality fish relating to that area in the grass um, and, and know, know where that area is. Don't just go out there and, and willy nilly, like wander around out there, like have it marked where you got bit and know where you're casting because like I was telling you, like that they could be relating to shell. They could be relating to like a depression in the grass or something like that, that you can't really pick up on because it's, you know, shallow grass. Um, and you can't really see it on your electronics real good. Um, you just, you just pay attention to that area and you go fish that area. And then if they're not there, check it later. Sometimes they pull up later. Sometimes they'll pull up before you got there, but you run your stuff and then possibly run it again. Um, but yeah. How much is wind really early on in Florida? And then also of course the Potomac, but we can also use Florida as an example. How much does that affect it? Affect grass? Because we talk about clarity and, you know, even when I was listening to Zona today and you before we started about like, well, th this is where the clear water is. And I know on the Potomac or grass in general that if you get the wind to blow, it actually stirs the grass up. And yeah. at least in my experience, muddy grass does not do very well. <laughs> right. Because it's so what happens is like if you get too much salt in the water. Oh, sorry. Um, if you get too much silt in the water, um, like it, I think it gets inside the fish's gills and they, and they're struggling to breathe. Just like if you were in smoke or something like that, like you can't breathe really well. You're not focused on eating. You don't want to eat. Once that starts to chill out and settle back out, you're fine. Um, but you do have to be mindful of the dirt. The wind can help you, can help you though. Cause it can, especially in that clear water, like, a, like, like you normally find on the grass um like especially around the spawn and stuff like it'll help you throw on moving baits like you can't like it's hard to throw moving baits on slick calm conditions because they can see the in in clear water because they can see your line better um they can see like issues with the bait better so you just i mean it's kind of a give and take but um okeechobee's uh more vicious about that because of two reasons um it's almost tidal like because that wind can fluctuate the water levels if you get like a north wind um the north side of the lake is going to get water drawn out of it and um i've been told that it fluctuates it up to a foot so you're already fishing shallow in okeechobee but you got to think like it just sucked all that water out it sucks that clear water out further and so like those fish will relocate to a little bit deeper. You're fishing in three foot of water in Okeechobee. Now those fish are in two foot of water if you're on the north end. So, um, and then on the south end, it does the opposite. It adds that water. And then it also pushes that dirty water in further. So it can, it can, um, it can dirty that area that you were in, that you found those fish. You have to push in to find those fish. Uh, this is a little off topic, but then let's say you're fishing Okeechobee. Like, are you fishing both south and north in practice? Uh, and then during the tournament, you check the weather and you make your decision. Uh, no, you check the weather ahead of time before you start practicing. It's it's harder if you're practicing like the weekend before because it's more variable. But mostly, what I'm doing is is fishing right before the derby, and uh, and you're practicing in there. Or you could practice um, two sides of the lake. So instead of north and south and running all over the place if you if you fish like the fish like the east side and the south side um and you get a north wind it's it's gonna suck it it's not going to affect the east side as bad because it's blowing out of the north um so you're not going to get those fluctuations like especially if you're like mid lake if it's blowing north to south or south to north or if it's blowing east to west or west to east it doesn't mess up that area um on the south end as bad um so you can you can play it a little bit like that or you could just go up in like taylor's or uh uh what's the other one well there's like another um uh, area that you walk through and um it's not affected by that so like if it really scares you that much but you just pay attention to the wind and if you you just don't you just don't fish where the wind's going to be blowing directly into but 
Now, Toho and the Harris chain really don't have that same issue when it comes to water. Right. Typically, the fish are a little bit deeper. Um, it can muddy up the water. So that that's still a factor. But mostly, but you're not getting that like shift in water um, like you do on Okeechobee. Okeechobee is just so massive that, and it's a big bowl of nothing in the middle. Um, Kissimmee, Toho, um, it's mostly just the wind. Well, if you get really, really bad wind, it'll stir up the water and it'll stir up the grass and grass uh for everybody that doesn't know grass is a filter so it actually holds dirt you go you go like stick your rod in the water you stick something in the water and you shake that grass you'll get a bunch of dirt that falls out of it because it's a filter um it it, it, it holds that so you get a ton of wind that that sits there and moves that grass around it'll shake that grass it'll shake that dirt out puts it in the water it takes a day or two for that grass to start cleaning it back up again so it's just like if you get muddy water conditions in another lake, um, a lot of times like you get like like real heavy rains or whatever, it goes in the water, those fish shut down because they, they can't breathe, like they can't see. It's completely new conditions. Um, it takes them a day, two days, three days to uh, start settling out and going back to normal. Now, um, while we're finishing up the uh, the submergent part and then we're gonna switch to um, the, the next stage in the grass evolution, do you do a lot of graphing? for your submergent is that a part of your game plan um so you have to find out where the grass is if you know where the grass is no if you if you do know if you don't um if you don't know where the grass is you do have to look for it a lot um especially edges is really important to understand where the edges are because you want to whenever you're on the trolling motor you kind of want to maximize um your time uh by just knowing if you just know where those edges are you can just go in and out to the edges you're not looking for the edges you're not trying to find them um so i'll normally graph edges uh and graph clumps too um if they're if the grass is clumpy um like, yeah. like that's not just like one big flat you do have to like kind of mark the clumps um but you don't just want to wander around out there on the trolling motor but for the most part it's a lot more uh trolling motor than it is uh and and put keeping your rod in your hand than it is uh um actually graphing for me anyways that's how i fish grass so good deal and now guys here's the next image let me get it up which is some i think this is what you call consimmy grass yep consimmy grass some people call it hay grass um see it a lot um in lakes down here toho kissimmee obviously where it kind of gets its name you see it a lot down in uh, okeechobee um this is emergent grass you also this falls in the same category for me as uh reeds and uh lily pads um i just kind of lump emergent stuff in the one um group Why? for this so that way because they fish similar um really yeah so um down here like you're looking for so we again a lot of this stuff is on flats it's a lot of the same stuff so you're looking at boat in this case you're looking at boat cuts it's it's more visual because you can see holes in the grass right you can see where it's thinner you can see where it's thicker and with this stuff a lot of the times you can actually run more patterns like if you're no like you'll notice sometimes that you just get bit out of the thick stuff or you just get bit out of the thinner stuff um so so this is a little bit easier to run patterns with same thing with the pads same thing with the um the reeds which is like we call cattails and uh buggy whips or bull rush whatever you want to call it um they they're all re uh they're all reeds just kind of just call them all reeds so how the hell you talked about like uh, you caught your best doing this and then you also do you not think this is the most enjoyable way to spend an afternoon in the summertime fishing how many casts are you just going like point point a pocket one time you're just yeeting it into the middle like how how do you break this down when you're casting um it helps whenever you have two people there so that way that you can go through it pretty fast and learn um um so like one person would flip the edge one person would flip back up in so whenever i do it i typically vary it until you figure out how far back in the fish are most of the time the fish are within like a foot or two of the the edge um but you're trying to just um 
you sometimes they'll be setting up on points or whatever, but a lot of times they're just they're just set up like on again like stuff that you can't tell like like you're not like oh like this is why they're here like the bait's just there in the grass for whatever reason whether it's better bottom or something i'm not really sure um sometimes it'll be bluegill in the grass like maybe the bluegill are spawning nearby whatever staging out there um but the you just go down the line you flip through it sometimes you'll notice um that the fish are relating to things especially more so it's like the thicker or the thinner grass um that they'll they'll relate to versus the um points or edges or whatever and like you'll catch fish off those but you also catch fish off of a freaking flat stretch of it like that's not obvious you just flip everything and that's something i i really think people are really going to gain a lot of knowledge from from this is when you see this vastness of cover you really are looking for signs of life and you're listening to your gut about this just doesn't feel like there's, there's something off about it. And, and I, if, if I'm correct in this analysis, so whether where you're on the Potomac or you're in Florida and you see a massive stretch of reeds or grass, like how long are you going without getting a bite before you're moving either down the stretch of reeds or you're moving down the submerged vegetation bank? <sighs> I, I am very much like, like fish everything until you know that that's not working. So especially, um, like if I know like that there's bait or something in an area and that the fish should be there and they're just not, I know they're probably not there. Like it's, it's not the, in you have to be confident in your baits and actually be fishing good baits to know this, um, and, and be somewhat in tune with what they should be eating that time of the year. Right. Like, you can't you can't be uh like like i don't know like uh let's say in the summertime like whenever you're flipping grass right um down here like it's like you know that it, that a jig is good um you know that a that a senko is good um you can flip like a craw or whatever right it doesn't matter too much certain certain baits tend to produce bigger fish like jigs like right like it's just it's just a thing um but you do your research you figure that out you flip something that's good and you just go and um it's 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 but more of it's doing research and knowing what plays that time of the year so if i know hey those fish are doing this i just need to find where they're at i'm just going until i run out of that stuff and then i go pack up to a new area because again you can't see necessarily what it is if you get out of the right depth range or you get the wrong bottom right like you get like real mucky bottom typically the fish don't like that right and you just know uh like like you could pretty much infer that they're not going to be there so you might want to like speed through that muddy bottom or whatever but um you you really need to do your research as as far as like what's playing that time of the year in in the grass like what depth ranges may be in the grass and then what baits and um you can and you can narrow down and cross out a lot of that stuff so that way that you're only spending time in areas that should have fish and you're just kind of figuring out where exactly those fish are set up um you just go out on a grass lake having no clue where the fish are at in the grass i mean you could fish grass that was good last month or the you know during the spawn and you're out there in the summertime and you don't know and you're getting frustrated because the grass looks good it looks just like all the other grass that everybody catches fish out of but you're there the wrong time of the year because you didn't um you you have to you have to you have to know what you're looking for before you go out there and just spend time in the grass or um just spend time out in the grass if you don't know and you there's no way for you to do research somehow like you don't have access to a computer in the 21st century you know mm. something like that but um you know it, it really helps just knowing what you're looking for and in the depth ranges because you can find that out and people lie in the write-ups like you have to keep that in mind but for the most part you can just um really people lie in the write-up crazy fishermen lie about how they caught fish yeah but, I know, right? <laughs> but I've found that if you read through enough of them, um, you get a really good general idea of what you should be doing, and then you just kind of dial it in. So 
don't don't be doing something like uh like somebody does something off the wall crazy like like they say that they're drop shotting a freaking spook or something and you know like like something obvious right like oh there were some kids that t- said that um in one of the write-ups they said that they were uh flipping mats in harris um and if you know anything about harris they spray it really bad and there's not any highest in mats in harris right now that are deeper than like this deep so trust me i went and looked for them it's kind of a red herring spent like half a day in practice keeping my eye out for that um I, I'm, you, you bring up some interesting points because like if i had to pick i would rather pick submerged vegetation because i feel like i can move faster and and cut down the learning curve quicker i could i could get to the better juice faster i can break the big area down but when you have a mile of reeds or you have a mile of mats that's where it's like annoying because it's like it slows you down yeah like how fast you can get through that stuff um so typically typically the fish are still grouped up so you can go relatively fast through it because you're just looking for like one or two bites because you're just looking for hey those fish are on this stretch right that stretch Mm -hmm. might be 25 yards 50 yards whatever but typically there's multiple fish in an area that if you even if you're fishing fast like you just get one bite but you have to be comfortable with knowing that that one bite means that there's probably fish here so you're not trying to be thorough in practice is what you're saying. So if you have, not at all. yeah, if you have a massive stretch, it's just like, you just want to get through the stretch one or two casts, right. like every couple of, okay. Right. That makes sense. And then, um, sometimes a lot of the times of the year, um, with certain conditions, you could throw moving baits to that grass and get blow ups or whatever. Like you don't care if you, like if you're throwing a big easy or, uh, like some sort of like, like, you know, paddle tail swim bait through the grass or, um, swim jig or something like that. And you get blown up, like, and those fish don't hook up and it doesn't matter. You know, those fish are there. Um, especially if you know that you could catch them flipping, like, well, let's like say in the summertime, right? Like sometimes like if you get nasty weather in the, uh, in the, in the, during the day or whatever, you can normally throw a big easy down those lines. You can cover a lot more water. Um, so if you can get, uh, if you know that a, a moving bait can work that time of the year and can get bit, um versus flipping or going slow down a grass line like throwing worms at reed pa- like like you see a lot of that like on okeechobee right now a lot of these guys are throwing like worms like four inch worms six inch worms to clumps of pads and stuff those guys probably didn't find that in practice throwing those worms to clumps of grass they were probably throwing a moving bait through those areas they located that there's fish there they know those fish are spawning right now because they they know through their research or through their history from fishing there that they're in spawn mode. So they know those isolated patches in those areas will hold fish. So they flip those slower during the tournament. Um, And, you know, sometimes a lot of the times, like for me personally, um, just because I caught a big fish somewhere in practice, like I could show up there and there's like two pounders there, like one pounders, like, like, and I don't, and I hardly catch anything that helps me in the tournament. And then I go somewhere that I didn't necessarily catch. Like I could have caught like two pounders there, but then I stick like a four, uh, because I only stuck like one or two fish there. So, but normally you have enough time in the Derby versus your practice. If you don't practice for, you know, 18 days, you only practice for like four or five, six days. Like I normally do and don't get myself spun out with too many spots. Um, you can run all your stuff and you just settle down once you start getting bit, um, and settle down into that area, um, in the grass. And then, you know, the next day, like you can probably eliminate some stuff based off of what you fished or start checking stuff. If you caught a good bag, you were like a prophet. Cause you do, cause you can tell like with his setup and this is Lester's gallery on bassmaster.com. Like he's basically, he's being very precise. With, he's not throwing a chatterbait. Right. <laughs> he's not throwing a swim jig at all. He's picking this stuff apart. Right. And that makes so much sense with what you're saying. Like he probably didn't do that for three days of practice to find out where to start. Yeah. So like, cause like you can see, like if you scroll up a little bit um, on, so like you can, you can kind of see in that, but if you go up like two more pictures, 
Um, uh, so you see those dollar pads and stuff behind them in those reeds. Um, so this time, like during spawning season, you can throw like, like, a like a big, like, you know, like six inch or whatever, um, like paddle tail swim bait or a swim jig with like a, with some sort of trailer on the back over the top of those. And you'll get bit. They might not eat it very good. Some days they'll just slap at it, whatever. But all of a sudden, you know, there's fish there. And all you need to do is be around those fish and grass and you'll catch fish. Um, typically speaking, like, again, so long as you've done your research or you've spent time out there, you know what those fish are going to eat. eat. So um, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, you know, and then he knows that, that they're in spawning mode. So and if you ever like spend time on a grass flat, um, I like wandering around looking at beds in clear water you know that they'll spawn on isolated clumps. You know that they'll spawn on clumps of like hydrilla or like next to something that's vertical. Um, a lot of the times so they're not just willy nilly, like somewhere, like normally they like to be up against something. Um, so you can sit there and slow down and catch more fish, a lot more fish than what you could if you sped through there with that big easy. So it is also so crazy when you look at these photos and this just gives me PTSD flashbacks to the Potomac in the summertime, <laughs> how close people can get in grass lakes where if you go to a lake, like a table rock, things like that, where it's just, it's wood docks, rocks, there's no way in hell you'd be that close to somebody fishing a dock without a fist fight breaking out. Yo, but in yo, grass, yo, those about bark out. They, they normally go, uh, what does uh, JT Kenny call it? Fist <laughs> Um, yeah 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 that that's that is definitely i mean i sometimes you sometimes you have to stick up for yourself whenever you're out there because people are going to try and chase you off and whatever on the grass but um you have to remember and remind them that it's a community hole and that everybody's fishing around and you just i mean be respectful don't buzz over there after they stick a five pounder right like that's just you're not going to catch that five pounder they caught that fish be respectful and uh whenever somebody's not being respectful stick up for yourself and just kind of say hey buddy like can you like like do you think that's cool mm -hmm. so you know I remember that. and keep a gun in the rod locker that helps too i mean just have a faster boat than everybody that that might help too but. or that uh, which i do not have mine's a freaking turtle um <laughs> i cut some notes here what was it? oh yeah so i got a couple more things and I, yeah that's why i have the gun <laughs> um oh crap what was my thought oh right uh so i don't keep you on i got a couple more things uh one is when well, you're talking about the spawn and i hear this a lot about you're just blind casting soft plastics so you get in the area you know they're spawning and you can't see them okay this is not where you've already gps their beds or whatever you're just in a spawning flat area how the hell do you blind cast? Like, how does that that whole process work mentally? Is it you just power pull down and then you just hit everything in front of you, pick the power pulls up, move forward, lock back down? Is that mentally your strategy? Um. So, what I was doing specifically, um, in the Harris, where the top two guys that won were literally blind fishing in a lake that you can't see fish ever. Um. I. I. And they were moving like, I think that they said that they were moving like 30 yards a day, something like that. Right. So what they're, what they were doing personally was, um, they were throwing at reed heads, they'd power pull down, they'd like throw around. Um, what happens is, um, or what was happening in that tournament for me was I found fish on beds, um, where I could see them, but barely see them in practice water dirtied up, um, a little bit, um, the day the first day of the tournament and then the second day um it darted up even more um so you would just see the beds but i knew the fish were there because i marked them right so i would personally mark the beds back off and then i would also blind pitch beds because you could still see the bed you just couldn't see the fish on them i stuck a seven pounder off of a bed that i could i never saw the male or the female and i caught both so i got i was blind pitching beds i got bit off the bed so like i like swung around i marked the bed swung around started pitching to the bed like where i could just barely see it and uh caught the mail and then i was like well he was really active so i kept pitching in there and the female bit never saw her never saw him you 
couldn't see the grass around the bed. You know, there's grass around the bed. You, Damn, it's I, gotta be a good feeling. Ah! Yeah. I mean, whenever, <laughs> whenever she can't, whenever I stuck it, felt 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 like it was a good fish that comes up and it's freaking seven pounder. Like you're just oh like, my God. dang. Like, did that really just happen? <laughs> did that really just happen? But oh, that's what these guys are doing down on Apopka is that they're doing that, that they found a spawning area around the reeds. Again, probably throwing something a little bit faster um, or they were flipping around really f- like, like relatively rapidly. They're not power pulling down for 30 minutes trying to see if there's fish there. Right. They're not, they're not doing that. Um, I, I, so they're either casting in there, just getting, getting pecked at, getting bit or getting rolled on. Um, or it's, it's either that, or they just knew whenever I was reading the write-ups, uh, the one guy said that he got bit in there. He didn't know what size his fish were, which is pretty typical from what I've noticed in grass. Um, if you do good out of grass, you don't know what you're getting into. You just go, you, you get bit out of it, you go fish it and it, it ends up being better fish. Um, and if it's not better fish, you move on to your next area. Uh, so but you would get the male that would pick up the bet, like pick it up as you're dragging through. They were very aggressive, normally first or second flip in. So if they're sitting there soaking their baits around these reeds where they know that 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 they're set up, just like I was doing in uh, Beauclair, um, you would get bit by the male with a female very, very quickly. So they were basically just going, dragging through that and... Um, but you know and that's why like it's absolutely seems like insane like they're fishing insanely slow like how do you power pull down and narrow it down to a 100 yard stretch well they didn't really narrow it down to a tournament and then they caught 24 pounds out of it and then they left it right the first day because they knew that or however much they caught the first day and they left it because they knew it was good they went back there the second day the fish were still there they moved down a little bit like where they hadn't got bit or where they had got bit or whatever um that's just that's just how you fish grass and uh, especially spawning fish is it i mean imagine doing that whenever the fish aren't like they were like um like whenever it's really hard if you if you've ever bed fished and a lot of the times you've got to sit there and pitch to a bed 10 15 20 times now you're doing it blind you don't know where the beds are um or you you know where the bed is and you just keep uh, but you can't see the fish. You don't know how the fish is reacting. It, you have to really have a really good situation, um, to make that work. And it's just, it's very rare. Um, but it does happen. It, it is, uh, it, it happens on like, it's, I don't know. It's hard because if you're fishing, uh, if you're fishing at BFL or one day event or anything near, now near you, you can be a hammer, a straight hammer fishing bed tournaments. But dude, I, I just, what happened in the tournament that you were in was a lottery ticket of it lining up with conditions and everything to where you could probably do that multiple days. I, I'm telling you, I would put money on it. There's no way in hell that would usually nine times out of 10, it work out like that. Cause it never does. You always hear the guys like, well, I had them, but then the weather conditions right. change and I couldn't bed fish anymore. Like it doesn't usually play out that way. My, my buddy had a, I think he had like a nine pounder of, and then that left a bed. And then he had a five and a four that were on the exact same bed together. And all three of those fish left. But my fish, yeah. my fish were harder to see. They were a little bit deeper. I think that deeper fish typically are going to be a little bit more stable um, in general. Like, right, like you have dirt shallow fish. They're not comfortable up there. Like it, they can be seen. They could get picked off by birds. They just, they don't want to be up there. They're not as comfortable. I don't know why they were up there that shallow. I don't know why my buddies were looking up there that shallow. Um, but I mean, you know they don't know good stuff. yeah but um you you just typically in fishing grass um the obvious stuff is going to be found um you know it's just if it's easy to see beds they're going to be found if the if the fish are easy to be seen they're not going to be comfortable either you have to remember that too um the fish know that 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 they're that they can be picked off by things above them 
like birds and stuff like that. So, um, uh, yeah. So you just, you, it's better to target things that are less obvious or to find the things that are obvious and then, um, have try and look for in that area things that are less obvious um also so that way like a little bit sneaky stuff like uh so you go hit that obvious stuff first catch what you can off of that because you know everybody else is hitting it and then save your sneaky stuff if you can um but i don't even remember what the original question was no no dude like that's why i just like to leave you just let you talk because uh it's it's all good because i call it like secondary versus primary like you know if you got a day one of a tournament all the obvious stuff will work the problem is like what is the backup because that shit's going to get hit hard day one yeah. and i think the fish are going to move and you can see this with like offshore structure things like that jacob wheeler talked about this on uh, chickamauga where it's like well i knew day one they're going to set up on the obvious stuff on this point but then day two the pressure is going to push them off to the next place and you kind of hit on that where it's like, yeah, you can assume day one, you can catch something in the obvious spots in an area, but do you know that spot within a spot that they're going to move to day two, day three? And that's how you cash checks. Right. And it's, it's not, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But in reality, if everybody was doing it, then they wouldn't be winning doing it. So it's just, because everybody would be doing it and it's just, and they would be cannibalizing each other. So, um, typically like those, those things also change. Um, you, you, so little nuanced things that are sneaky or like, like sneaky patterns, um, tend to change just because people catch on, you have live coverage now. Um, so mm. typically speaking, what happens is, is that, uh, people catch on to things really quickly and then that sneaky stuff changes and you just kind of got to stay on top of it. And I think that a lot of people that don't fish a lot, they just can't stay on top of it. And um, uh, they, they hurt themselves by not staying sharp. Um, yes. And and not getting a group. I think a group that gives you the right intel where, yeah. I, like, I don't know, like I, I've learned, I don't want the doc but it'd be nice to know what part of the lake. And when I was younger, I'd want to know the dock, the stump, the water, like all that. But now it's like, I just need to know like what part of the lake is on and then I can figure it out. And having friends that you can trust with that to help you be in the right generic area is so important. Yeah, that definitely helps out a lot. Um, because, and, and, and even, and even if they can't help you, um, find the fish maybe they can help you eliminate fish or like fit fit like like you have okeechobee right like and somebody went to south bay or like a certain section of south bay and they said okay i had a really hard time catching fish down here it was kind of a grind okay what were you doing okay so i shouldn't go down to south bay and do that but maybe i go want still want to go down to south bay so I just don't really do what they do too much. Like maybe I do throw, throw, spend a little bit of time on it, but in the back of my head, I know, Hey, like it's not really a good bet because a lot of the, what, what you're doing is playing odds, right? Even in practice, like you're, you know, you're playing odds as to what's good and you're upping your odds by talking to your friend group, eliminating things or just keeping things in your head about like, okay, this might be good. I need to spend more time on this or, Hey, this, this seems like everybody's struggling to find fish this way or in this area. I shouldn't really spend too much time there. So, um, but even if it's eliminating water, like that helps a lot, right? Like, uh, like Harris, mm -hmm. for example, I shouldn't have fished Harris because of what everybody was saying. Harris sucked. It was hard to get bit in. And I spent half a day in practice in Harris, um, whenever I should have just went and spent my whole last day of practice in Beauclair. And I ended up catching all my fish, um, almost all my fish off of what I found the last day, uh, in Beauclair, um, like the last half day in Beauclair. And then, um, what I found in the tournament besides one fish, I think, um, that was helped me out. But other than that, it was, that was it. So, I hurt myself by not listening to my friend group. And that was, that was an example of where I could have really used that to my advantage and 
and uh yeah so it, it's it's crazy how much it ups your odds i guess would be like a good place to put it a good way to put it whenever you can trust somebody and that they're not giving you like red herrings like oh i caught them flipping mats and like like what we're talking about like flipping mats and uh harris like like matted hyacinth right whenever there's not a hyacinth mat deep enough to hold fish i mean you know if you have buddies that are lying to you and telling you stuff like that like and then you go looking for it and you waste half a day like you have to be very selective and you know it's good and but you also need to be a trustworthy person whenever you're in that situation too like don't be lying to your buddies don't be throwing them down um down rabbit holes too because you feel like it would be bad for you or hurt you whenever they're helping you also. So, yeah. And guys like, cause I can already hear the comment section. Um, just a a pin on this. And what I'm talking about when it comes to information is not getting like, you know, throw it at this dock on on, with this color bait. I'm saying like, if your fishing example is a big lake or in your case, the Harris chain, they're helping you narrow down the lakes. Even that breadcrumb (laughs) is huge. Uh, when I fished a Kerr event, like back in a regional and I sucked balls in practice in the first day. And they said like, dude, down Lake is actually where it's at. And then I went down Lake and I figured out enough to finish in the top 10 in the event, uh, in the points. And it was just, that's all I needed was the crumb of like, you're where the bigger population of fish are firing. And then if you're a decent enough angler, you can then figure it out. And just even having that crumb is huge for eliminating water. Yeah, for sure. And that's, um, like the whole like 90 percent of the bass live in 10 percent of the lake like you have to find that 10 percent of the lake well yes you know your buddies can help you do that and you still should be doing your own thing anyways a lot of times um, i've noticed that it hurts a lot of people that do that they they tend to get spun out because they can't make something happen if they're looking for specific information so i would say that it really like people that are that are trying to find every little tiny detail or trying to find somebody's specific fish. Uh, it, it tends to hurt them more than help them. Um, and they tend to get spun out because they don't really, they didn't find those fish. Like you should still be trying to do your own thing. You should just try and do your own thing around the fish. Uh, yes. Put yourself around the fish, figure out where the fish are at, maybe like a depth range or like maybe eliminate baits that you're not that that you're typically comfortable with um that that they're just not eating right like the water might be too clear for a chatterbait um you know or whatever like like your buddies are all telling you hey like they're not eating a chatterbait like i've been trying to throw the shit out of a chatterbait like maybe don't throw the chatterbait right maybe but (laughs) but it's not it's if you're just sitting there like like the guys that do um try to to chase other people's fish i guess um is a good way to put it they're typically behind the ball and suck anyways so yes because they get spun out because they can't figure it out or they're not dialed in and they can't adjust to those fish i i i yes honestly it's just you don't have the confidence in yourself you don't believe in your skill set yeah like you see that a lot with those guys if i told you like you know it is on fire in belmont you'd only need that. And then you give a day of practice, you go to Belmont, you figure it out. Right. And I gave you the crumb that I just eliminated a lot of the Potomac river. Right. And now you know where to start your practice. A, a, a bad angler would be like, but where in Belmont and what do I need to throw and right. at what depth? And it's like, that's, I, you already lost me about me giving you information because you're, you're missing the point. Right. And but, yeah, it's but like, you know, yeah, I won't, but, but again, like you, you still have to be able to trust that person, right? Like it, yeah. if if i don't trust you like like if i don't trust that person that's giving me that information i'm not gonna sit here and go down a rabbit hole you know i might i might spend a little bit of time on it but i'm not gonna sit there and like 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 be careful who you trust to is basically what i'm trying to say um have a good Amen. friend if you're gonna try and find a gr- good friend or a friend group um make sure that it's a good friend group um not people are gonna send you down rabbit holes not people that that uh, suck so um amen H- harry like i don't want to like like i don't want to be here till midnight um is there anything else or anything you want to plug social media wise there'll be an episode description um i mean you guys can always follow me follow me on uh instagram um currently at harry the fourth um might change i'm trying to figure out a good 
brand for myself as far as, as to change. But right now it's at Harry the Fourth. Um, you can always follow me on TikTok. Uh, the same thing, except for there's an underscore between um, Harry and the Fourth. And then um, I have a Facebook page, but not a fishing Facebook page because those don't ever go anywhere um, unless you're already big. So um, typically speaking, that's going to come later. Um, but you can friend request me on Facebook. It's just Harry Linson Bigler IV because I am the fourth. And uh, you'll see the fishing picture. Um, it's actually from my co-angler days whenever I got second in an open uh, on Toho. Um, and yeah, so other than that, um, I guess just, that's where you would follow me at. So closing thoughts though, uh, just make sure to like in grass, especially um, try and find things that are um, like where the fish are relating to. I mean, you're just, you're just looking for that. Um, and like, ultimately speaking fish more than you're looking, but pay attention um, to those, to those nuances and whatever and uh be very vigilant as to like marking waypoints and knowing where those fish are so that way you can find them again so because i promise you on a big giant grass flat you have a you know 200 foot shell bed that they're relating to that you don't even know that that's what they're relating to but that is what they're relating to you know you need those waypoints to find them again so good stuff and, and we'll definitely uh we'll definitely have you back on here when you win your next tournament and then hopefully this <laughs> This this summer too, we'll have you back on once the grass really gets matted up where we're at, yeah. and maybe you can, we get more precise on <laughs> on matted fishing. Maybe um maybe I'll swing you up there for uh, the Potomac in September, and I'll be able to talk Hell about yeah. that. And maybe that'll be the next one I win. Yes, back to back on the Potomac. It's so weird how many people that aren't from here. Like I had another friend that won in the All Star, and he's from Ohio. It's just so weird. Like everyone I know. That it's the people that aren't from here that just do so well in the Potomac. It's so squirrely. I think that says a lot about grass fishing, though, in that it's you have to um, be very open minded. So yeah, I I really do I really do think so, um, guys. Anyway, that's it for us tonight. Link in the episode description, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts Thomas Aaron's and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.